Hello, and welcome to Split Informed and Split Smart. I am your host, Carl Roberts, and excited to be here for our show on the WGSN-DB Going Solo Network. The intention behind Split Informed and Split Smart is to help all couples, amicable or hostile, to more easily reach positive, equitable, and peaceful agreements in their divorce. I believe that most everyone in their right mind or not want, deep down wants peace, love, and equality in their post-divorce life, and that no one person should be able to deny that from the other or their children. That is the principle upon which Split Smart was founded, a tool that helps everyone, regardless of emotional or mental state, better stay on course for a more peaceful and joyous ever after. But before solving problems, you must fund first understand their root cause. For divorce, we know that the single difference between a good and ugly divorce is simply the presence of a bad actor. Bad actors can be one or both, man or woman, lawyer or litigant. We know that bad actors are typically good people who've just gotten tripped up by their emotions, bad advice from friends or family or lawyer, and often a personality disorder of being a narcissist or a borderline personality. With that, uh, today my guest is Dean Tong, is our, is our guest. Dean is based in Tampa Bay, Florida, but also works across the country. Dean is a certified forensic consultant, which is a fancy way of saying that he is an expert witness in the realm of high conflict divorce, specifically with allegations of abuse. Dean, I know you keep a full schedule, so I, an extra big thank you for being here. Carl, well, thanks for having me this morning. I appreciate it. It's, it's an honor. Well, the honor's all mine, brother. I really appreciate all, all the work that you do. And, um, you know, so, you know, I think you kind of represent more of those, you know, the, the horror stories that, you know, that are, that are that you know, people kind of, when they think about a bad divorce, they kind of think about a lot of the stuff that you deal with. I mean, what people, what most, what society doesn't realize is that most people can get through this divorce fairly easily enough and do so easily enough. It's just when they get chipped up by, Mental health issues, in my in my belief, that that's where things go south. So, give us a little bit of background on yourself, Dean. Oh boy, um, how much time do we have? <laughs> not much. Not okay. much. No, uh, I am. I, you know, like you said, I'm a certified forensic consultant, trial consultant, trial expert, uh, published author of three books. Um, I uh, work the highest conflict of cases in all courts, criminal, family, and juvenile courts across America. I have worked cases in all 50 states. I've testified as an expert witness in 15 of the 50 states. Um, I have been doing this work for over 25 years professionally. And if you include my own personal involvement, it goes back over 35 years to the mid 80s. <clears throat> so uh, my cases are uh, pretty much the ugliest of the ugly. Uh, allegations of domestic violence, child sexual abuse, child physical abuse, Munchausen by proxy, failure to protect, failure to thrive, shaken baby syndrome, uh, you name it. And uh, oftentimes when I get involved, uh, while I appreciate the, your work and CeCe's work and the work of people who try to uh, smoke the peace pipe in these cases and get along, in my cases, that's usually not the, not the case. It usually is going to go to a trial where there's going to be a winner and a loser. Obviously, in the best interest of children, we try to work it out. We try to mediate. We try to conciliate. We try to smoke that peace pipe and have a powwow. But in my cases, because one person oftentimes will have a fixed and rigid belief system that the accused uh, did the abuse and won't come off of that belief system, that belief system can project onto the children. Um, you mentioned borderline and histrionic personality disorders. You could probably add in paranoid delusional. Uh, you could probably add in uh, F24 and the ICD-10, which is shared delusional, shared psychotic disorder. Um, so, you know, in my case is multiple experts, pediatricians, sexual abuse nurse examiners, psychologists, psychiatrists, a plethora of people. Uh, you include uh, prosecutors and guardians ad litem, attorneys for the children. You include child protective services and their lawyers. Um, and you can understand how embroiled, how protracted, how contentious the cases can be. 
All right, so with this, so it's kind of hard to figure out where they even start with all this because it is a big, big deal. And again, like you say, that you're dealing with the worst of the worst, right? Um, and um, but the, and then there's the, so that's you know they got kind of the tip of the iceberg of what the overall problem is, but there, there's just that, that massive part of that iceberg that's still under the surface that that the more common person kind of deals with, um, right. you know, and and so. All right, my, my best advice there, Carl, is my, my website's been on the internet for over 25 years, back to 96, uh, abuse-excuse.com. There's a plethora of information over there, scientific studies, legal case law, citations and reviews and studies. Uh, you could literally spend a week over there clicking on all the links and downloading and printing and studying the information. I, I do encourage people to do, do your research, do your homework. Uh, you know, understand what you're involved in. Most people, like you say, are naive, unwitting uh, to court. They just assume that they have a licensed attorney, that the attorney is going to do the job and get them through this mess and get it get it done correctly. Uh, you know, f- get them the equity in law they're seeking in court, just like a doctor who's going to perform surgery on you. Everything's going to go hunky-dory. Well, it's not always the case. And, and no lawyer can guarantee you an outcome in court that's going to be favorable. Uh, because you can't predict what a judge or a jury is going to do in a, in a case. All right, well, um, let, me, let me let me shift gears on you here real quick. So, you know, just kind of did read the article that you had published in uh, Divorce Magazine uh, just recently. And uh, first of all, your your vocabulary is way above mine. <laughs> and I think I got a pretty good vocabulary. And uh, but um, and so one of the things that kind of struck me in your in that um, was that uh, you think or you stated that uh, only 5% of the cases are false allegations. That's correct. Um, you- yeah, there's, there's a definition there, Carl. Uh, by, okay. false, we're, by false, we're meaning premeditated malice of forethought. We're, we're talking about bad faith. We're talking about picking up the telephone and calling the toll-free abuse hotline, which in, in CC State, in my state of Florida, it's 1-800-96-ABUSE, and, and I'm going to ruin your life. That is a false allegation where it turns out to be a witch on a fishing expedition. That's not most of the cases. Most of the cases, that's about one in 20 or 5%. Most of the cases are what we call source misattribution errors. There's another reason or hypothesis going on here. It could be suggestibility where a well-intentioned, well-meaning worker or therapist is putting words or thoughts or ideas in the mind of a kid, okay? Uh, it could be the molest happened or abuse happened, but you got the wrong guy, mistaken identity. Uh, kids, kids get this, these, these things uh, from a thousand places. Art Linkletter wrote it best in his book. Kids say the darnest things, uh, way back in the '60s. So, and I'm talking about you know improper touches by adult men or daddy, uh, especially when you get a, a contentious divorce, parenting time dispute, uh, custody battle where alienation may be involved, and a parent is turning a, a kid against that other parent uh, to get custody, child support, social status as the most fit parent, uh, even to do, as I say in, in my articles, a parentectomy, removing that parent from the child's life and vice versa, and, and obviously uh, turning that child against the targeted parent. This is alienation or emotional, mental, psychological child abuse. My article published yesterday in Divorce Magazine articulated that the, you know, the most compelling, the most egregious form of alienation uh, is the false allegation of abuse. Uh, but most cases are not false. Most cases are, uh, you know, basically unfounded or unsubstantiated. The government will tell you, well, we didn't have enough evidence to, to preponderate and get to 51 percent to find the accused guilty. Uh, therefore, we had to unsubstantiate it. Well, it, you know, th- that's a nice way of saying that uh, you know, maybe you didn't do source monitoring and look down another avenue for another hypothesis. You have a belief system. You're trying to justify and validate your belief system because based on information you receive. I, I might also say, Carl, most of these cases are he said, she said, what a child said, they said, what's called hearsay. Hearsay, by definition, is an article of statement made for the truth of the matter asserted. Generally speaking, hearsay is inadmissible. Not so in these cases. This is rule 803. This is the exception of the hearsay rule. So when a child says you abused her, when a woman says you abused her, that's coming in. That's the exception of the hearsay rule. If you tell a doctor, a nurse, a therapist, a teacher, uh, my father, my stepfather, my, my mother's boyfriend abused me, 
That's coming in. Uh, it, a judge is going to allow that in, that hearsay, that out-of-court statement is going to come in. Uh, it's going to be a battle. That rule, be, that you rule you cited, was that, is that a federal or is that a, a state? That's rule? federal and state, Rule 803, right, Rule 803. That's correct. And pretty much all states have the same rule and, and, and admit the same hearsay when it comes to children and women. So uh, kind, of, kind, of, kind of coming back down to that mandatory reporting, right? That's correct. And, and, and you know, what that is, is any, any mandated reporter has to report any reasonable suspicion of child abuse or neglect. Well, what's reasonable to one therapist or teacher may be unreasonable to another, okay? It's all subjective discretion. Uh, obviously, a mandated reporter is going to err on the side of reporting uh, to, to launch an investigation by the government. The government can work what's called in loco parentis parents patriae, the state as the parent, Hillary's village. In other words, this is the government taking taking over the control of your life and your kids' lives. Uh, they can remove your kids in a New York minute. Uh, if you try to interfere with them, they'll, they'll call the police, and you'll be then arrested for obstruction of justice. So, you know, this is a conundrum. It's a quagmire. And, and, you know, like I say, like I say in my books, uh, at my website, uh, not all lawyers are created equal. Lawyers don't get this stuff in law school. Be very careful of the attorney you're selecting for this type of case. Um, you know, the, 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 the link in my website, the section in my book, how to choose your attorney this is actually, this is actually a science, how to pick the right lawyer. Yeah. So, I mean, I, so just, yeah, I mean, God, I mean, again, there's plenty of, Routes we can rabbit holes we can certainly dive into, and I and I, want, I do want to kind of folks stick stick around a little bit more with around the whole false deal, um, you know. So I've been I'm pushing some legislation here in Colorado, and uh, and 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 the, the the one stat that I pulled out was from in Colorado reported to you know, that uh, there was forty thousand uh, cases of physical abuse reported to child protective services over the last four years, so ten thousand a year. And then 88% of those were dismissed as unfounded. And again, I'm getting back to your to your you know different levels of definition from unfounded, unsubstantiated, uh, as well as just plain out false. Right. I know my, my my case was before that, but it was certainly you know I had four cases of you know opened with you know with uh, CPS on me uh, that were all quickly you know closed as unfounded. And and from from my perspective, those were just flat out false. Trying to you know kind of trying to create some you know trying to gain that advantage in, in child support or child custody, and so there I mean so certainly in this you know for those of us who kind of have been through it and I'm sure you probably heard the term as well, but whether it's the iron tri triangle or the the silver bullet, making that accusation again doesn't have to have any substance just to come in and for the judge to hear it yeah. immediately triggers off his 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 well, biases that he wants to, you know, err on the side of the caution. Yeah, there, there is no silver bullet, Carl. That's that's ideology. It's a term that's thrown around by the Father's Rights Movement, but it's not science. So I, I discourage people from using that terminology because it's not going to pass in your state of Colorado. Uh, the, the case law that governs admissibility of science and expert testimony in your state of Colorado is called SHREC, S-H-R-E-C-K, the SHREC test, which is consistent with Rule 702 in Daubert. There's no way the silver bullet is going to pass legal muster with any judge because there's no uh, reliability or validity to the silver bullet. There's never been a period. Well, I, guess, I guess what my pushback is, is it I means so again, only a very select few of these cases ever kind of get to the complexity and in, in, in really or truly adjudicating the, 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 the act or not. And not, so not, not, you know, not in my cases, Carl. All my cases go to Yeah, go no, to you're, trial. No, you're dealing with the worst of the worst. So I understand that. And uh, and so, yes, yeah, so all your cases are, are getting kind of litigated in, in some form or, or fashion or adjudicated in some form or fashion. Yeah. But where I guess, again, I'm thinking more about that, 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 that part of the iceberg that's just under the waterline. Right. The, the, but the but I, I, just, I discourage people from throwing terminology like the silver bullet around, you know, or or um, one in three, one in three girls in, in America are molested uh, on a, from a bill, billboard or. The website uh, d2l.org, Darkness to Light, or mozac.net, Mothers of Sexually Abused Children, or rain.org, uh, the Rape and Incest uh, Survivors Network. I mean, you throw around this stuff and it's, it starts being believed. That's the problem. So let, let's stick to real science that has 
you know, passed legal muster according to the Darbert Fry rules in court, and that has achieved statistical and clinical significance through peer-reviewed studies. Uh, I, I just don't like to go by ideology and, and dogma that has not passed science in a court of law. I know, but that's, I mean, but I guess that's where I'm trying to kind of get at is from the standpoint is you are absolutely dealing with that court of law. So you have to rely on science and specifics and, and, and you know. Well, and, and I mean, that that's where all these cases go is a court of law. I mean, you know, if, if, if CPS is going to come after you in Colorado for what's called the DNN, dependency and neglect case, they're going to file a legal petition against you through their attorney. You're going to wind up in a court of law. Uh, well, then it could be Dean Tong time. Because there's going to be a trial, an adjudicatory evidentiary trial, where you have to prove you're not the monster that CPS is alleging you are. That's how this works. As my website says very clearly, you are presumed guilty of the accused. So, yeah, and, and again, I'm not, to, not to, 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 just trying to, you know, again, so like I have my four cases that were brought against me and, you know, all dismissed. And uh, and and so so we didn't have we didn't really get to the whole adjudication part of it. Right. And so we got again, we just got to the, you know, it's more than just the hearsay. So the judge hears that, you know, there, that there's this claim of abuse. And so judge, I mean, because in society we have you know, through movies and TVs and, and whatever else, we, we certainly believe that. The, the, the first picture that, uh, you know, when somebody says the words domestic violence, the picture that comes into most people's mind is an abusive man and a, a victim woman. And, part yeah, and that, you know, that's coming from the limbic system in the brain. That's the that's the part of the brain that controls your emotions and memory. I mean, and that, but there's so much of, I mean, just again, where, where we have been you know, programmed or, or to believe. But and, yeah. as, as you probably well know, in, in the, you know, the CDC uh, statistics show that you know women are more oftentimes the perpetrator of child abuse, domestic violence, and course of control. It's physical abuse, I would agree with that. Not not sexual, but physical abuse. Right? And uh, and so and so and that's probably where I'm up, more. My repertoire is is around more the physical as opposed to the sexual. Um, and uh, and so it's you know so again in part and so. Again, when we talk about hearsay, again, not even that having to adjudicate. So when you get, you know, kind of custody evaluator and she's claiming this and 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 so he is he's got that stereotype in his mind that or that that the custody evaluator has this stereotype. And then, well, you know, I need to kind of err on the side of caution or a judge needs to yeah. err on the side of caution. And that's where you know, we're and in. And and if you do that, if you do that, Carl, whether it's a custody evaluator or the or the uh, trier and finder of fact on the bench, the judge. You err on the side of caution. You could be erring on the side of a non-abused child who's being treated as a truly abused victim. So I have the studies on that. I have the peer-reviewed uh, articles on that going back to almost 30 years ago to 94, the effects of false accusations upon children and families. Uh, it's not pretty. I mean, we, we can see the same signs and symptoms of behaviors of, of kids who haven't been abused versus kids who have been abused or raped. Uh, I mean, it's going to leave an ace, adverse childhood experience, for sure. And so I, I get a lot of cases where, again, well-meaning governmental child protection workers, well-meaning child uh, psychotherapists will start treating for a condition that doesn't exist, whether it's play therapy or EMDR or TFCBT, whatever therapy modality you're using, uh, you know, you have to vet out the source and origin of that trauma. How do you know the child was abused before the merits of the case has been adjudicated in a court of law? But you're treating, it's like treating a kid for cancer with chemotherapy or radiation before a lab or doctor has diagnosed that kid with cancer. There's no difference. You're treating that kid as a de facto abused victim before the, before the adjudication of the merits in the case in a court of law. You can't do that, but you are doing that. And, and all the harms that extend from that for that child. Yeah, and I'm going to call you out on that. Yeah, I'm going, call, I'm going to call you out on that in a court of law under oath. Dean, let's. Uh, there's probably a good uh, a spot to take a break here, real quickly. Um, uh, this is Carl Roberts with my guest uh, Dean Tong um, on the Split in, Split uh, Informed and Split Smart Show. We'll be right back. get divorced and become involved in the family court system, there are no winners. Everybody loses, especially the children. 
I know, because my custody battle lasted years, was completely unnecessary and financially devastating. That experience inspired SplitSmart. SplitSmart is designed to empower both parents by giving them the structure they need to stay on course for a more peaceful and respectful co-parenting future. For less than amicable couples, our unique line item negotiation approach helps soften sometimes emotional stances into child-centered agreements that both parents can live with. Do you want your children to thrive and grow up with healthy, loving relationships with both parents? How much easier would it be if you could bypass the conflict and create a clear, supportive, and comprehensive co-parenting plan and schedule that's tailored specifically for your family? Can you imagine what it would be like if there were no arguments about money or child support? If any of this appeals to you, if you want to minimize the expense and drama of divorce, do yourself and your children a big favor and use SplitSmart to craft your co-parenting and support plans. And as an added benefit, even if you've done your best and still can't get all the way there, SplitSmart will have your information well organized, so a skilled mediator or family lawyer can efficiently help your family cross the finish line. Visit SplitSmart.com today to get started on creating a brighter and more joyous tomorrow for you and your kids. This is Carl Roberts back with uh, my guest, Dean Tong, certified forensic consultant, uh, or, another, or another way of saying uh, a, a trial uh, expert witness on in high conflict divorce, typically associated with uh, abuse or sexual abuse claims. So, Dean, thank you for, again for being here, buddy. Um, my pleasure. Carl. Yeah, it's just it's just it's just, it's just a, you know unseemly area, about you know <laughs> as the most polite word, kind of kind of talk about it but it, it, i mean so what is i mean golly i mean again where do you start <sighs> obviously that you know a lot of people i mean so i'm, I'm assuming that uh, uh, the, the 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 vast majority of your clients are men uh i, I would say it's about 80 20 80 percent men and 20 percent women i i want to he i helped to win a huge case here in florida for a mom uh, a few years ago, right before COVID started uh, in Daytona Beach, and uh, my gosh, the state of Florida must have spent three to four hundred thousand dollars to try to terminate her parental rights from start to finish. You know, the trial lasted four months. Um, I was in for what's called what they called Expert Week, which was a entire week in April of 2019, so almost three years ago. Uh, the short of the long was uh, we won the case. The judge concluded the uh, Department of Children and Families in Florida did not prove their petition by clear and convincing evidence, which is 75 percent. That's the legal burden of proof you have to get to to TPR uh, a parent accused. OK, uh, judge concluded they did not prove uh, prove their petition. And we you know, we we uh, we allowed the mother to continue to have her maternal rights and she was reunified with her son. Um, you know, and that got the case out of juvenile court to family court. So only a juvenile court can terminate your parental rights. A family court can suspend your parental rights, but they cannot terminate your, your parental rights. So, um, so, so again, can I get, can I get into the origination of, of a, a lot of these cases? But you, I mean, from, I think what I've kind of gleaned from you is that a lot of these cases are coming from good faith, just caseworkers who have been who are who are trying to you know again bear on side of college or whatever the, their logic may be they they think they're doing the right thing well yeah and and look carl uh, everybody has a policy and training manual right everybody has to adhere to what's called evidence-based best practices and adhere to their published guidelines and policy and training manual so you know cps it's called dhs in your state uh, DCF in my state, it has a different acronym in all 50 states, but it all means the same thing, Child Protective Services. So they have a policy manual. 
Uh, the GAL, guardian ad litem or attorney for the child, they have a policy manual. Uh, therapists have to adhere to code of ethics. So, for example, a, a therapist who's uh, uh, who suffers from a, a same fixed and rigid belief system as a well-meaning mother who's falsely accusing a father of incest, uh, who, who adheres to that belief system, who's treating that kid with dolls and puppets and drawings, play therapy as a uh, de facto abused child in a de novo case before the merits of the case has been adjudicated in court, could be violating APA Code of Ethic 3.04, which is you're supposed to avoid harm. First, do no harm. You're taking the same oath as a therapist, as a physician does in uh, coming out of medical school. First, do no harm. Don't pour gasoline on a fire here, okay? And so, you know, you're not an investigator, but you're supposed to consider other sources of possible trauma to that kid besides the fact that daddy touched your pee-pee. Uh, you know, there's a thousand reasons going on here why that may have come through hearsay. And so uh, it could have been a book. It could have been, uh, you know, uh, the devil takes the youngest, or the courage to heal, or uh, you know, could could be strong kids, safe kids. The video on 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 the internet with Henry Winkler and Marianne Harley and John Ritter, which is about stranger danger, child molestation protection. Um, you know, it, it could be a billboard. Uh, it could be a thousand things. Could be another. These, 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 these nuggets, of, these little memories, or these little nuggets, or they, you know, yeah. pump somebody. Yeah, so, the law, so the law, the law, Carl, the way the law works, and 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 mind you. Uh, in order for a judge or jury to believe a child, uh, a child's word in a he said, she said credibility shootout in a court of law, the law says the child's allegation must be made spontaneously, contemporaneously, uh, from his or her own free volition, uh, in order to be considered reliable and trustworthy. Those are the three factors, spontaneity, reliability, and trustworthiness. So that's coming from the implicit unconscious memory, the same memory where you would brush your hair, get up in the morning and take a shower and put your jeans on, go drive in your car. You don't think about that. That's the same memory as going back to when, uh, you know, you've been shot in Afghanistan or Iraq or Vietnam or been raped. You're not going to remember the entire trauma. You don't have a photographic memory. So you're going to remember bits and pieces of that trauma, what's called just memory. You're going to remember bits and pieces. Now, whether you can recall the uh, initial event, post post event recollection, so your your memory is coming from your reconstructive, unconscious, implicit memory versus your reproductive, conscious, explicit memory. Now, your memory may be contained, contaminated, or adulterated because you've had therapy, you've been interviewed ad nauseum five or ten times by CPS and the police and child forensic interviewer and a therapist and a teacher, a guidance counselor, a school psychologist, custody evaluator, okay? So, you know, memory's not a perfect videotape. It decays and fades with the passage of time. Uh, it just so happens the high-profile Gislaine Maxwell case that just concluded in New York, uh, my longtime associate, Dr. Elizabeth Loftus, was her lead expert. Uh, her, Dr. Loftus's testimony is on the back of my book, Elusive Innocence. Dr. Loftus has published 20 books, her most famous books, Witness for the Defense, The Myth of Repressed Memory, among uh, her other 18 books that she's written. Uh, and her CV is like a tome, uh, her professional resume. Uh, the lady's basically unimpeachable. She wasn't the reason, uh, I don't think, Gislaine Maxwell got convicted. Okay. Um, with that said, uh, you know, I, we could talk about the uh, high profile Dr. Uh, Christine Blasey Ford case on CNN against uh, Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh. She's accusing him of sexual harassment or abuse from 30 years ago, back in high school. Again, you're not going to recall the entire event or trauma, bits and pieces of that event. Uh, wh whether you can go back uh, in your memory bank and go 10 or 20 or 30 years ago and recall the initial outcry spontaneously, that's the key. That's the key right there. That's what the law requires. So let me let me interrupt you again, Dean. Uh, so a couple of things, because I do want to kind of touch on a few things before we kind of get out of here. Um, so, again, the perception oftentimes, you know, again, from a, a layman's viewpoint of things, is quite often times you have CPS or, or some other child protective uh, body right. that, you know, where, you know, if you have a hammer, everything's a nail. 
and and so they you know try you know so and and then you have a lot of these victims' rights. Uh, yeah, so the, the the operating maxim becomes: children don't lie. Children are not uh, mistaken about assault or abuse. They must be believed and protected at all costs. This is a child protection system. It's not a family reunification system. That's not what this is about. And I'm going back almost 50 years ago to 1974, the Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act, CAPTA, named after our uh, late former Vice President Walter Mondale, also known as the Mondale Act. That law created this uh, this beast, if you will, Child Protective Services. Now, do we need a, a CPS in America? Absolutely. Absolutely, we need one. We need some type of age to protect children because we know children are abused physically, sexually, uh, you know, and, and we know, uh, you know, that this stuff happens. So we have to have a protection agency in place. But, you know, this can be a double edged sword. You know, you're leaving children at risk in harm's way and jeopardy. You're not protecting kids who need the protection. Then on the other side of the street, you know, you're, you're conducting a witch hunt, a fishing expedition. Uh, so, you know, you know, and, and so the, the job of the defense team is to come in and try to vet vet the allegations, what CPS did in their investigation to to make sure that they adhere to their policy manual. I mean, I was brought in in, in a case 10 years ago in in, uh, in, in Newport, Rhode Island, uh, where I had to go over for the judge 25 violations of the CPS manual by the uh, Rhode Island CPS worker in the case. When I got to uh, violation number 25, the judge was just shaking her head and said, thank you, Mr. Tong, I've heard enough. Uh, well, we won that case and the CPS worker was fired, you know, and, and look, I mean, uh, these CPS workers, uh, a lot of them have bachelor's degrees. Some of them have master's degrees. Uh, they're not experts. They are fact witnesses. There are three types of witnesses in court, lay, fact, and experts. Only experts can give opinions. That's the only witness that can give an opinion is an expert, whether you're a medical expert whether you're a, a subject matter a subject matter expert like myself in false allegations of abuse, I'm allowed to give opinions in that area. I give about five or six different opinions, whatever the, uh, you know, it might be sexual risk assessment, it might be parental alienation, it might be said sexual allegations of divorce, whatever the case may be. But I can't give a medical opinion on whether uh, a child suffered a broken hymen, medically speaking, upon coposcopic anal genital rape examination. I can't give that opinion. I'm not a medical expert. So, you know, and, and you'd be surprised how many lawyers don't know uh, the, the, the specificity of opinions an expert can give in their little niche area of science. Okay, so, golly, you and your daggum vocabulary. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so we've got some root cause problems here. Uh, one is uh, laws, statutes, and le legislation. Yep. The other is is the policy and, and policy, uh, policy and, and admin, uh, you know, practice books. Well, then you have the belief system, and then of course. Hold on, you, hold on, hold on, hold on. So where? I mean, so if you know, so you got an advocate out here like yourself and me and yourself that. Uh, well, I'm, really, not, not, I'm not an advocate. Okay, well, hold on. Okay, like me, and then uh, so I mean, and you're trying to change laws, or you're trying to change policy. Uh, to, to you know again back to this whole thing of do no harm where is where is that where's where's that attention to be spent should it be spent on policy or should it be spent on law well so you yeah. a limited amount of time and resource and effort you know if you change if you change policy you're going to change law either way you're going to wind up testifying at a state legislature or washington dc in front of congress right either or uh, that, that's not my job that's not my job my it's job is to my job is to help the attorney clear a wounded innocent uh, one case at a time, whether that's a mother, a father, another kid. He heck, I've had child-on-child -child sex abuse cases where I've had to help a 16-year-old kid who was falsely accused of molesting a 6-year-old. So, I mean, you know, look, these allegations don't take a holiday. Uh, it could hit anybody at any moment at any time, uh, you know, and, and – uh, uh, it's a well-meaning, well-intentioned system, but it's broken. Make no mistake, it's broken. And and with all due respect to to the court system and and CPS, they have a lot of cases, too many cases for one individual to handle. I mean, heck, I operate a caseload of twenty to twenty-five cases at all times, at all times across America. Uh, I don't look for work; it finds me. 
Uh, trust me, <laughs> you know. So, and so, in, so in this in this broken system of us, uh, again, just kind of looking at CPS, how can things be better triage? If that's a good word for the two again, yeah, I, I don't know that that can happen, Carl. As long as you're not going to not going to have PhDs in the field doing investigations, these are not PhDs. These are not psychologists. They're not licensed clinical forensic psychologists in the field doing these investigations. These are okay, social. But, but these given, social the, given, the, given the world that we have that, that we live in and the system that we operate within, how do we how do we improve CPS? Well, I think you have to complement CPS with another agency, um, maybe uh, involve the police. Uh, we have four or five counties here in my state of Florida where CPS are actually housed in the police department. Uh, that could be a good thing. If we do a study on that and we find that there's a better outcome, um, you know, from, from a peer-reviewed study uh, of the police being housed and going out on, on dual investigation uh, roles with CPS on cases, Versus just CPS in your normal state like Montana or Wyoming, uh, you know, and and I think I think we have to look at that. Uh, obviously, changes in the, in the law uh, have to have to come to fruition. I'm talking about CAPTA and VAWA and ASFA, okay. Uh, but that's that's going to come in time, um, you know. Uh, the Democrats are, are are usually the ones that err on the side of caution. The Democrats are usually the the, the liberals. Who uh, you know? Who who, who want to put all the money into protection, protection of women, protection of children? That's a great thing if there's no boomerang, but there is a boomerang. Uh, I've had over one million one hundred thousand hits to my website. Uh, that's a lot of traffic for one guy. Uh, those aren't people just bumping into me. Those are people that have been hit and affected by this issue. Yeah, I mean, so I mean, and, and again, part of my advocacy is, I mean, again, again, just boys and men, and so, so, so much of this, I man. Again, when we talk about VAWA, you know, the billions of dollars that kind of extend from VAWA, VAWA every year, and then pennies on the dollar are really kind of being attributed to to services and and, and trying to protect men and in, in, in all that situation. So, I mean, there is this, and, and, and we're not going to solve domestic violence. Reckon, you know, thinking about it as a one-way street, it's a two-way street. Sure. It's a it's a it's a multi-gender issue, and right now is is historically we've only treated it as a single gender issue, and that's, well, sure. that's where we where where you know kind of the underlying foundation is where we fail, and where yeah, I mean, uh, you know, a longtime associate of mine, Phil Cook, is the author of the book Abused Men: The Hidden Side of Domestic Violence. Uh, how, how many domestic violence shelters do we have for men in this country? Maybe one, maybe two. So, you know, um, look. Uh, even, not, to, even, not, to point, even to the point where you have a mother that comes in and has a twin 13-year-old children, one's a boy, one's a girl, right. and she needs, she needs that, that, that shelter, that boy's not allowed. Yeah, and look, I'm not saying women and children are abused. They are all the time. Yeah, but absolutely. There's, you know, you know, there's a flip side to this. Uh, unfortunately, most of these cases fall in that gray area, that that 50 or 51 percent threshold area where, it, like you say, like I say, a judge uh, can make a mistake on the side of caution. Uh, but does that judge understand uh, that side of caution? Does that judge understand that, you know, you are basically uh, educating that kid, training that kid who might not have been abused to grow up that, gee, when I get a hug or a kiss, on the forehead or the cheek, that that's consistent with sexual abuse. Because I've been through multiple investigations of child sexual assault uh, against my uncle or my father or my grandfather. So, you know, we, we can't be, uh, uh, you know, treating this like a crapshoot. We got to get this right. You know, we, we have to be, I, I have to act as that needle in a haystack that helps a lawyer get this right and figure out uh, you know, if this happened or this didn't happen, but I can't go there. That's rule 704, the ultimate issue. And, and that opinion can only be rendered by a judge or a jury. All I can do is lead the horse to the water. All right. Let me, let me interrupt one more time that uh, so from the standpoint, again, looking at solutions here. I mean, so again, part of my advocacy is around, you know, you know, the, you know, probably our greatest societal ill right now is fatherlessness, children without fathers in their lives. And, and, and one of the, one of the, 
the root causes to that is you know the family court and the decisions and the, and the adjudication that's been placed in these family court and these family court the judges. Court. Pardon? Preaching the choir. I mean, David. Yeah, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, so so yeah. in in but one of the one of the partial partial places to try to help mitigate that problem is it like to do as they have in Arizona and Kentucky and you know to some degree in uh uh well I'm sorry it, it well to a large degree as they've done in Arizona uh Arkansas Kentucky and and uh uh I'm getting my my states me said Arkansas Arizona but creating this rebuttable presumption of equal parenting. Well, I mean, California, well, California was the first state with joint joint physical custody. Well, the joint physical custody, but not rebuttable presumption of equal parenting. Well, that's what it should be in all fifty states. I mean, look, well, in, yeah. my, in my state, in CC state, we have we have time sharing. So, in my state of Florida, if you're a father, uh, you are a high rise condominium. You're a time sharer. That's what you are in Florida. You're going to get Disneyland dad visitation rights every other weekend, every other birthday, every other holiday, maybe a month in the summer. Unless it's, it's Dean Tong time, you're going to go to a trial. You're going to go to a trial. You're There's going to a lot of people can't afford Dean Tong. Well, I mean, I mean, I get cases, Carl. I mean, I mean, a lot of my cases, if you're in criminal court or juvenile court, uh, you don't have to have any money. The, the judge will order the state to pay my fees. And I've got probably half a dozen cases on my plate right now just like that. Now, in family court, I agree with you. You get as much justice as you can afford. Until the legislature, uh, you know, allocates uh, resources for parents who can or cannot afford a defense in form of papyrus, and you can prove you are poor in family court, uh, I'd be more than happy because I offer anybody who who's a uh, indigent in, de in dependency court or criminal court, you get my services at a 50% discount. That is published published on my website. All right. Well, Dean, we're going to have to wrap this up, brother. Um, yeah, I mean, I get, I get yeah, it's, 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 it's obviously a, a soft spot for me or, 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 or excitable point for me. Uh, again, just because I, I know in my, I had four CPS cases open and closed on me. I had more than 15, 15 police contacts, you know, and, and, and again, for no other reason besides, you know, and, you know, you know, uh, what's 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 the what's the phrase? Uh, uh, hell has hell knows no fury like the woman scorned. Well, and how many times were your kids interviewed in all those investigations? Yeah, exactly, you exactly. And, and so, how, and you know, I came out much better than a lot of people do. And and uh, and again, so but for for all those people, moms and dads who have lost their relationships, who lost those childhoods with their children. And, and then what those children have lost in not having that active, involved parent in their life, not having that father in their life, yep. you know, the, the every, just about every other societal ill stems is exacerbated to one degree or another by children not having fathers in their lives. And we need to be able to protect the best interests of our children by giving them both parents and protecting that you know, kind of equality of that. And I think that that's e most easily done through rebuttable presumption of equal parenting. Yeah. Let, let me also say, Carl, in these CPS cases, if you do go to court, uh, you will be asked to sign what's called a case plan. Okay. Which are hoops, hoops, the accused uh, is charged to jump through and substantially comply with. And that's, that's not always a green light to get your kids home and get your kids back and reunify the family. It's, okay, so yeah, I don't have polite language for any of that. But anyway, so Dean, thank you so much for being here today, brother. How, uh, let our audience know how to how to get in touch with you. Yeah, thank you for having me again, Carl. Uh, my website, abuse-excuse.com. All of my contact information is published at the same. And uh, obviously, uh, uh, email uh, is probably the best. Uh, my website actually has a uh, accused questionnaire form. Well, if you fill out, if you have a case, um, I don't charge any fee for that. I, I give a complimentary uh, response to your to your query, and um, and certainly uh, that includes lawyers. Um, hopefully, I can help you out. Hopefully, you won't need my help uh, in a case, and hopefully, you can get through this uh, you know th this issue quicker than not. 
Dean, thank you for the work that you do and uh, for all the people that you, all the uh, boys, girls, men, women that you help. Thank you much, brother. Uh, this is Carl Roberts with Split Informed and Split Smart. Uh, thanks for joining the day. Wish you a thanks a lot. Proud of teacher. Bye bye.